Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Roberry. I am a Consumer Insight Director working in the nutrition team at Cantor. Um, my disclaimer here is that uh, I'm not a natural nutritionist, rather that the data I analyse is nutrient contents, nutrient volumes. Um, I'm here this morning to talk to you about the role health plays in uh, the content of consumers' uh, shopping baskets. But before I go into that, Further, I just want to give you um, a brief overview of who Kantar are for those of you who may not be aware of what we do. So we at Kantar are the experts in consumer behaviour and attitudes and the data I'll be talking you through today comes from our 30,000 household purchase panel. This is the largest continuous consumer household panel in Great Britain um, and it's chosen to be a demographically representative panel of the country. So in essence what we're looking at is the shopping behaviour of a mini GB population. The panel report to us all of the food and drink purchases um, that they make and bring back into the home. So we're looking at take home food and drink purchases, um, whether that's come from a, a main shop in a big four um, super, supermarket or whether it's a, uh, a top up trip to get a loaf of bread and a pint of milk from the local corner shop. Um, they should all be recorded by the panel and it also includes um, online purchases, so any purchase from Ocado, um, Amazon Food and Drink, but also you know, Tesco Online, so that will also be captured within our data. Um, separate to the panellists telling us what they buy, we um, record the nutritional content um, of um, products, um, so the, the big eight back of pack nutrient content information, we capture that. Um, and we apply that to all of the products that our panel purchase. On top of this, we also have a subset of the panel who report to us on the uh, consumption of the food and drink they buy, and they tell us about um, not only what they're consuming, um, what the occasion is, who's with them, um, and what is driving um, those consumption occasions. So with all that in mind, I'm going to pull on, pull on various aspects of that as we go through these slides. Um, just to kind of give you an insight or our, our view on health um, and what it means in consumers' shopping baskets. Um, <clears throat> now, when we look at health um, and the role it plays in shopping baskets, it's not as straightforward um, as it might first seem. There are various factors that will be influencing and be at play here. We kind of boil those down into three distinct areas. The first of these is government, um, government regulations, um, but it can be anything from public health campaigns such as Change for Life and the Better Health, um, the recently launched Better Health campaign, um, attempting to uh, influence uh, consumers' decisions on what they put into their shopping baskets, through to uh, regulations and reformulation plans looking to, um, almost by stealth, um, make shopping baskets healthier by requiring manufacturers to remove certain nutrients from their products. And then on top of this, we have taxes and levies, which are looking to almost change consumer decisions based on the price of the products. Um, so there's a lot going on from the government side of things, not all of it, which will be immediately in, um, obvious to consumers, but it will be impacting what goes into their baskets. The second element is consumers themselves. Um, health is quite open to interpretation and will mean various things to different people. Um, and it will, um, it, they, those reactions to health will have an impact on what goes into their, into their baskets. The final element is retailers and manufacturers themselves. Um, not only that the, the products they decide to, to make, but often um, what they decide to range as well. And this will often be influenced both by government action, but also consumer action, um, as well as their own agendas and plans. A good recent example of this is um, Cadbury's Christmas selection boxes. Um, they used to contain a fudge bar. Um, this was replaced a couple of years ago with an Oreo bar. This led to um, some backlash from consumers who, were, who, who, who wanted to see the fudge bar reintroduced. Um, so this year, the fudge bar is going to be part of the Cadbury selection box. Um, however, uh, in an effort to kind of meet some uh, or uh, re reduce the sugar content um, of some of, of their of their profile, um, the fudge bar is actually 
small in weight. Um, I think the stated aim is to get it under 100, 100 calories. Um, so that's kind of a, a good example of uh, kind of how, how, how retail manufacturers might be influenced by both consumer and government choices. And these elements were all in play um, before coronavirus and lockdowns came along. So when you add that into the mix as well, there's um, there is a lot to factor in when we're um, thinking about health and consumer baskets. Um, so just, just kind of kicking off and looking at some wider consumer attitudes um, to to their lives in general. Um, these attitudes were collected from our panel. Um, it's one of the other elements we have available to us. We can ask. Um, Kind of attitudinal questions to the panel. These were asked back at kind of March, April time. So kind of just before, just, just as lockdown was coming into effect. Um, and the first one here I just brought up, or the first couple of ones here, are looking at um, people who agree with the statements that my diet is very important to me and I try to lead a healthy lifestyle. Now, the majority of people say yes, in some way to those questions. Um, which on the face of it is good news. Um, obviously, this is open to interpretation though, so what may be one person's healthy lifestyle and an important diet may not be the same for someone else. However, um, I think the key thing here really is to take out that a huge majority of people, the majority of people in fact, um, do want to lead a healthy lifestyle and say diet is important to them. Um, it's just we need to keep in mind that what that means will mean different things to various people. And I'm sure if I asked everyone watching this what a healthy lifestyle meant to you, um, we'd get a multitude of replies. Um, maybe I'll, um, I'll ask that question when we come to the live Q&A session later this morning. Um, the other important thing to take from this, though, is that there is also um, a, a large group of consumers out there who say that um, leading a healthy lifestyle isn't as important to them um, and they aren't as concerned about their diet. And these consumers um, shouldn't really be forgotten in, um, in, in the general focus on health. There is a core group of people out there where health isn't as important to them um, and they need to be catered, need to be catered for as well. The other um, factor I wanted to raise was that when we look at the trends um, of responses to these statements over time, we are seeing um, actually that the number of people saying that yes, um, that art is important to them is starting to come down and that people saying they want to live a healthy lifestyle has kind of plateaued. So we may have kind of reached, um, certainly at the start of this year, the, maybe the peak of those responses. And one of the reasons for that might well be that there's just a lot of competition for people's headspace when it comes to what they want to focus on. Um, particularly as other health areas or things that might relate to health are becoming more prominent in the news um, around sustainability, around environmental health, um, and things like veganuary and stuff like that um, becoming more important and more pressing on consumers' minds, you know, is how much plastic is in my product. And I bring up the two examples here just to show that although they have a smaller um, proportion of people agreeing with them at the moment, it's these areas where they're actually seeing um, increases. Um, so these kind of environmentally friendly organic are becoming more important to people um, as as we go through as we go on through time. Um, and I think it's also important to keep in mind that health as a reason for consumption is actually the least important factor um, when it comes to the decisions people make about what they eat and drink. Now, the data we're looking at here comes from our consumption panel. Um, so that's the subset of our main panel who, who tell us um, about the food and drink they're consuming and why they're doing that. Um, and it's not to say health isn't important, it's, it accounts for almost 20 or it accounts for 28% of all food occasions, health is a factor. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that convenience and enjoyment um, are much more likely to be driving um, shoppers' consumption moments. Um, and ultimately, you know, it, it comes down to the fact that you, you, you can have the healthiest product in the world, but if it doesn't taste nice, people don't enjoy it, then they're unlikely to come back um, and buy it again or even want to buy it in the first place. So. I think it's always key to keep in mind that if we are focusing on health, um, we also need to keep in mind that 
products need to be enjoyable. People actually want to feel like they want to buy those products um, um, for that reason. Um, and one of the reasons why this is so important is that when we look at our combined, um, our take home panel or out of home panel, we look at the number of consumption occasions that occur in a year. We see that there are, um, from our data, are 82 billion consumption moments annually. And if you think at each one of those moments, these three factors are taking place. Um, health isn't always going to be the most important factor. Um, sometimes people want to treat themselves, sometimes people just want to have a bit of a, um, a more unhealthy meal and they want to have pizza, they want to have chips. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. The other point here is that health, we know from our data, is, is the uh, of the three is the most likely to fall back in importance when times are tough or when consumer confidence takes a dip. Uh, we saw this following um, the 2008 recession um, and we did see this again at the start of lockdown. The first sort of three months we saw that health as a reason for consuming food and drink really kind of dipped down. It, it dropped to 25%, which it may not sound a lot, but when we look at this data longer term, we don't see those kind of sudden dips. So that really stood out to our consumption team when they saw that data. Um, the good news, however, now is that um, health as a reason for consuming is um, back up to 28%. So it has kind of recovered, um, although our latest data takes us just up to October. So now we're into lockdown two. It'll be interesting to see if that then takes another dip or if people are a bit more aware of what lockdown means and maybe it won't have such an impact on that, um, on, that on, on their decisions. So what does this actually mean um, in terms of consumer shopping basket and what's going into them? Um, what we're looking at here is kind of our, almost our classic nutrition team slide. Um, we're looking at the change in volume for the different nutrients. And the data I'm showing here um, is a pre-coronavirus, pre-lockdown view. So we're comparing the change in, in volume um, in the 52 weeks to February 2020 to compared to 52 weeks to February 2017. Um, the chart is showing the percentage change in the volume of nutrients in that time. And the best way to read the chart is to kind of it's to look at the bars in grey, the nutrients themselves, and see how they compare to the bar in green. The bar in green is a change in overall volume. And if all things were being equal, we'd expect the nutrients to all be kind of increasing in line with that. As we can see, they're not, um, which is when it comes to things like calories and saturated fat, a good thing. That growth is below the, bar, the overall volume indicating that those nutrients are sort of coming out of consumers' baskets. I also wanted to highlight that actually sugar and sodium uh, volumes were in actual decline. Um, and I've just highlighted here sugar being down 7.7 .7 percentage points um, compared to volume growth, sodium down 5.5 percentage points compared to volume growth. Um, and there are a couple of factors within that. So we know with sugar, um, a lot of that decline was coming from soft drinks. Um, the move away from kind of regular soft drinks into diet and water products. Um, and that was something that was happening before the sugar levy, the soft drinks levy came into place. But also as well as that, people are buying this table sugar. Similarly for sodium, um, that is again a reflection of some of the government reformulation plans. So that's been a kind of a longer term goal to have salt come out. But we also know that people are buying less table salt um, in general. Um, one of the key things to keep in mind though when we look at this slide is that this is just we're looking at take home shopping we know that out of home accounts for around about 20 percent of what people eat so that needs to be kept in mind when looking at these figures so although these figures are positive um we still have the out of home market um but we know consumption is more likely to be towards more unhealthy products um and looking at the data um, at, a, at a shorter time frame, so looking at 12 week ending periods, just to get an, uh, a view on how lockdown has impacted shopping baskets. Um, what we're looking at here, the chart is showing calorie growth um, compared to overall volume growth and the, the, um, how they differ. So anything below the axis is showing that calories were growing behind volume. So in essence, uh, shopping baskets were becoming less calorie dense 
anything above the axis is showing calories growing ahead of volume. So in essence, baskets are becoming more calorie dense. And we can see really, I mean, I've highlighted it in different colors here, but you can see it straight away that the impact of lockdown immediately pretty much led to um, shopping baskets becoming more calorie dense. And there are a couple of reasons for this. I mean, at the start of lockdown, people were buying a lot more um, in terms of the volume of the baskets, almost in just in case. Um, I wouldn't quite go as far as say it was stockpiling, but it was a lot more, um, a lot of products were being bought in just in case people needed them in the home. Um, <clears throat> also at that time, we know that pretty much the only place you could go and eat was in your home. The, um, <coughs> excuse me, the sort of out of home opportunities to eat and drink were really limited. Um, the you know, schools and universities were closed, restaurants were shut, pubs were shut, attractions and venues were shut. So really all of the consumption that would have taken place out of home was moved into the home. Now overall, we, when we looked at the total consumption occasions, we did see a slight drop compared to more to the same period last year. However, we also saw that um, treating occasions, so having, a little, having something to eat or drink as a treat to yourself, that really spiked at the start of lockdown. And we know that food and drink consumed at those occasions are more likely to be kind of sweets and snacks, so less healthy. That has now come down and plateaued. Um, but again, as our data stops just before the lockdown two, we're not sure in a moment what the impact has been on, um, on that trend. So, although and we've seen short term, there's been a, a basket becoming more calorie dense, but the longer term view has been that take home baskets are generally becoming healthier over time. Um, so you might think, well, why is all this? Why is there to fuss around? Um, help the government restrictions on, on, the, on the nutrients. Well, we, we can see from this chart that despite this good news, the, um, the proportion of the population, the adult population who are classed as overweight is significant. It's, um, it's almost two thirds for men and almost the same again for women. Um, and if I just highlight the proportion who are classed as obese, um, we can see that it's all over a quarter. And you add to this the fact that a third of children are overweight by the time they start secondary school and the estimated costs you know obesity and diabetes has to the nhs and the economy um it's in it's billions and billions of pounds so this is why we know this is why government want to act and we know why they want to do it and if we look at um why they might be taking some of those uh, actions. Um, what we're looking at here is a heat map of the healthiness of shopping baskets um, crossing two of our demographic groups, so social class and life stage. And basically the the the, the darker red the colour you are, um, the more unhealthy the basket is. The darker green the colour, the more healthy the basket is. And we've done this we, because we have the nutrient content of all the products. Um, we're able to work out the NPM score of shopper baskets. We have to estimate the fruit, veg and nut content. We have the score and we can compare that across different categories. Basically what we can see is that probably unsurprisingly, um, the, the less you have to earn, um, the less healthy your basket is. And again, probably something that'll be no surprise to anyone with children um, for any kind of Income brackets, if you have children in the family, particularly teenage children, your shopping baskets are the least healthy within your demographic group. And I'm just highlighted here two different points. The DE families with teenage children, um, with children over 10, their baskets are four times as unhealthy as AB pre-family groups. And we know it's the, um, the kind of the DEs for people in red on this chart are the people who are least likely to respond to public health campaigns and to be checking nutrient pro nutrient information of products, um, which I think partly explains why the plans are in place from the government. Um, those reformulation plans, we know, so we've had the childhood obesity plans released, we've had sort of reduction targets, We've had um, the, the third year of the sugar reduction reports being published. We've had the calorie reduction program announced. Um, 
But I think the biggest announcement that's been mentioned this year is when it comes to the high fat, salt and sugar, so HFSS products, um, the plans the government have to ban promotions, to ban advertising, um, and to restrict where those can be placed in store. Um, and it'll be, it still remains to be seen how effective those plans will be. They haven't fully come into place yet, but we can look back and see um, the effect of some of the previous government plan uh, initiatives. So the soft drinks industry levy, um, or sugar from soft drinks has come down by almost kind of 30%. Um, a lot of that has been credited to the soft drinks industry levy. However, we, we've seen in our data that the sugar content of soft drinks was coming down bef even before the levy was announced. The levy's kind of kept that going forward, but it was already on that way down. Um, as I mentioned, it was a lot of it, but the product mix that people were buying within soft drinks. Um, people moving towards diet, moving towards water and away from sort of full sugar drinks was very much a part of that. Although interestingly, um, within our, some of our more recent data, we have seen that there has been a bit of a shift back towards um, kind of full sugar drinks, and that's kind of been led through um, juice drinks and squashes, um, possibly likely with, with more children at home, um, it could be one of the reasons for that. And on the flip side of where some of the government regulations haven't had quite the impact that was hoped, um, within the sugar reduction programme, we've seen in the year three report that um, only kind of at a total level within those categories, sugar reduction is down by 3%. Um, there have been some categories doing much better than that. So breakfast cereals, yogurts and ice cream have seen much larger reductions. Um, but on the whole, um, a lot of those categories haven't really come close to where they need, where the government would have liked them to be. And a lot of that isn't from lack of trying. Um, it's just that sugar is such an integral part of so many of those categories. Um, it isn't easy and it's not cheap um, to replace it. So it, it is tough. It is tough out there, um, particularly if you're in those categories. Um, and even if manufacturers do reformulate and launch new products, um, there's no guarantee that they will be successful. Um, you, you face they face the risk of a backlash from consumers um, being accused of shrinkflation. The um, I get the the Cadbury's fudge bar I mentioned at the start of this of these slides. Um, you know, they, there's a risk of that you can be accused of shrink. shrink shrinkflation um bringing back the popular product but at a at a lower at a lower lower weight um so that does bring me on to the hfss restrictions and the government's better health campaign um they kind of were launched together the better health campaign really focusing and it does mention heavily in the pr about um covid and um it's linked to being overweight so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and if that starts to change consumer attitudes and if we do start to see more people again starting to say that they want to look the healthy lifestyles with darts important to them. And using our data just to have a broader view of how much of the market might be impacted at a total market level we see it's about 26% of volume is accounted for from products classed as HFSS or less healthy. Um, it's about 40% of spend, but at a total market level, this includes things like uh, cooking oil, um, even avocados. If we focus onto the onto soft drink sugar reduction program and calorie reduction program categories where we think it will focus, these numbers go up. So it's about 43% of volume for those categories and it's about 56% of spend. So within those categories, there's going to be a a huge impact um, in terms of the, the, the amount of products that were likely going to be affected. And if we look at um, what that might mean, I mean, if we look at some of the scores for products, it's, it's going to be tough um, for certain categories to make make changes to um, to um, try and comply with those regulations. Um, Looking at the NPM score for certain products, um, I've kind of touched on here already that um, you know cooking oil has a score of 20. You can see that dairy milk bar has a score of 24. Um, but even um, when we look at um, the kind of healthier options or the sugar reduced options, um, the dairy milk, 30% less sugar has a score of 19. Um, there's no way that that 
that product is going to be able to suddenly change itself to become to be classed as healthy on the NPM score. So there are going to be a huge amount of categories where they're just going to have to. There's no, there's no chance of them being able to change to become to be seen healthier. Um, which leads to, I mean, it's, it leads to questions then. Uh, there's going to be a lot of um, tough decisions for retailers to make. I mean, gondola ends still need to be filled. If it can't be with these types of um, HFSS products, it, it does open up opportunities for other categories to kind of fill that space. Um, will, will it lead to other categories being promoted more? Um, it's, it's tough to say at the moment, but it, although HFSS restrictions are going to lead to um, some tough times for some brands and manufacturers. I think it will also open up opportunities for other categories um, to take advantage of. And then just to finish off, I'll try and finish off on, a, on, a, on a, another positive note. Um, and this is looking at the the overall um, proportion of baskets which have healthy or unhealthy products based on the NPM score um, and really a, a shift in consumer purchasing. So during lockdown, um, what we've seen is that the online channel has been has seen a huge increase in people shopping online. Um, at one point during the summer, it was almost um, its value had gone up almost um, almost twice what it was the previous year. And the reason why this is is good news in terms of the healthiness of shopping baskets is that we can see that online shops have a higher proportion of healthy products in them compared to physical shops. Um, and whether this is because tend to be a bit more pre-planned or there's just less chance to impulse buy um, you know, unhealthy products, the 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 increase um, is good news, particularly if you're kind of um, looking for um, increase in public health. Um, and we know now, you know, Ali Little mentioned they're either trialing click and collect or they're trialing some online shopping. If, if they really go big on that, um, then this is likely to increase the proportion of people buying online is likely to increase even further. And if this stays true, um, this could lead to a, a, um, a further shift towards healthier baskets. Um, uh, in take home shopping. So just to wrap up all of that, um, I started off saying that health, health is important to consumers, um, but it's facing increasing competition for their headspace and attention. There are other wider um, things going on, um, not least at the moment from, um, from, from COVID. Um, Lockdown has seen baskets become more calorie dense. However, that was starting, that has been starting to change. Um, and now we've had the good news of um, a vaccine to come. Will it mean, um, you know, brighter prospects for 2021 will this lead to a renewed focus on health from consumers um, that become much more important to them? Um, and we've also seen that government action is increasing and for some it will result in significant impacts on how products are sold and advertised but for others there are opportunities to be had here um, as I said gondola ends will still need to be filled is there opportunities for certain categories to take a chance and fill those gaps so and um, that's the end from me today um, I'm taking part in the Q&A session later this morning um, so I look forward to um, hearing your questions and um, uh, uh, seeing what you have to make of this. So thank you and goodbye.